I was wondering if, you know, Erica, you could talk a little bit about what did that mean at IAC and how did you guys get internal buy-in to do this project? Um, well, I think we already had a shift to more cloud-focused tool sets in general, especially as security has gotten better. And being that a lot of our data isn't, say, as sensitive as some financial institutions, it makes it a little bit easier and more open. And in general, I think IAC Publishing Labs is pretty good at embracing new technology if we think it's actually going to solve the problem. Um, the other things we saw, again, is just that our current situation was so badly implemented, it just wasn't working, that it, it wasn't hard to be like, hey, look, at this awesome thing that we can do. And then we also did have a large Hadoop cluster that we effectively were able to shut down because once you're up in the cloud, you are then able to have on-demand Hadoop clusters. So it didn't really feel like we were giving anything up. If anything, we were expanding the ecosystem that we have by being part of the AWS. Uh, we also looked at other vendors like Google BigQuery, and again, it's just a smaller ecosystem. I mean, Amazon just got a huge advantage having uh, been around as long as they are. So that was a, a huge selling point. And we're starting to actualize that a bit with our data science team. Uh, who are now starting to see, oh, we can get this data out where before we couldn't, and we can start using our own tools and our own microservices in AWS. Tevye, mm -hmm. do you have any comments about what it took internally at Hotel Tonight? Um, yes. Um, so we were, I mean, this isn't really advice, but um, mm -hmm. you could just be really slow at doing everything, and people will ask, how can we make it faster? And you'll say, well, there's this great new technology. Um, but we were just really slow at, at going, getting through our roadmap because um, you know, the marketing team was waiting for reports, the supply team was waiting for reports, and we were just like, every week, it's like, well, we didn't really get to do much on that because we were fighting a fire. So um, when this promise of a new technology came along, um, I mean, it, it takes um, someone who's got enough experience to you know to have the um the reputation that they they can make this decision and and be trusted with it um you a, a, a junior data engineer is probably not going to be someone who can sell the company on making a transition of this scale um but you know i've been around for 15 years um, my cto has been around longer um, he fully understood the architecture um, and that really helped. It wasn't like just saying, trust me. Um, so it, it helped to have a partner um, at that level who had the um, ability to make budget decisions. Um, but he did say, you know, this is your project and you have to make sure it succeeds. And he gave me an incentive, which is, you know, you get to work on all this fun stuff you've been wanting to do if you can get the data warehouse under control. So um, it was kind of a, a partnership that way. Um, but yeah, uh, just be really slow at all of your work and, and people will ask you how to make it faster. Uh, we use a couple different channels. Uh, we, one of the things that's, that's nice for Snowflake about us is that we, we not only can kind of curate our own kind of direct to JSON ETLs, which we do just inside of Snowflake, run with shell scripts. Uh, so we can do that, and that kind of gives us access to the entire universe, but then we also bring it down through its normal pathways and dump it out with kind of different group buys where, that would not, normally not be supported by our kind of production, MySQL, uh, customer-facing setup, but then also bringing it in through um, ETL tools uh, so that you know, any kind of stray um, Heroku DB or MySQL DB that's kind of floating out there. We just kind of bring it all in. So some of it, you know, the analytics team has curated itself. Some of it we're piggybacking on existing efforts. Um, but like I alluded to earlier, the Snowflake for us is the layer where all the data ends up, whether it's from a cloud service like Salesforce or like support data coming out of Zendesk or something that's already been turned into a relational database that we're just kind of copying into Snowflake. It's such a cheap place for us to store and merge data to not have to then like write an expensive Databricks job to get at it, um, that it just makes total sense for us to do it that way. Yeah, so that was uh, probably the biggest bottleneck for us was actually getting the data up. I think I heard Bob Muglia, uh, Muglia allude to that, that the, the network speeds are actually kind of our biggest uh, bottleneck. 
Uh, currently, our production ETL actually takes data in that's been streaming in our JSON, breaks it up with this black box of a system, and then breaks it up, sends it up to S3, and we copy it in. Uh, as you can understand, this is a you can imagine this is a pretty rigid system uh, and it's been a source of some headaches. Uh, I actually got sign off today, this morning, on the QA of a new system where we're actually going to avoid that local box. We are streaming the data directly into Snowflake and we are doing all the uh, ELT in there using those JSON capabilities. So now we're going to be able to move from uh, moving data up every hour, which was already improvement on our on-premises, which we had to do every five hours to avoid contention with users, uh, to every 30 minutes, we will be have completely cleaned process data. Uh, so that will mean star schemaed, backfilled, suspect detected, all done, ready to go for analysts, where our current system actually has a one-day latency. Uh, just kind of a fun thing that came out of this. Uh, our streaming system, when we first started testing it, was too fast. We actually had to increase, we had to add an artificial lag because it was outpacing our suspect detection system. And we were like, our analysts are probably gonna have questions if all of a sudden our human traffic went up 10%. So uh, just one of the nice things going back to, we are actually able to have better real-time analytics uh, by cutting out the local system. Yeah, um, so our, we, we like to use third parties where we can because we have a very small team, data team. Um, so we found Fivetran, which has partnered with Snowflake to ingest data from a lot of different sources, and we're using them to pull in our Postgres and MySQL data that the, that the platform uses to store all of its transactions. Um, and we're also using Segment, which is a, an event processing system. Um, it's kind of like Kafka in the cloud, but they also sh will stream your data to a bunch of places. One of the places they'll stream it is S3, and so our apps send all their data to Segment, and Segment drops it in S3, and we just pull it into Snowflake that way. So um, yeah, we've leveraged a lot of um, third parties for that. Um, and then we also have like our own S3 kind of uh, detector where we can just drop stuff in an S3 bucket, and it'll pull it every now and then and pull it in um, based on the file name. So that's where we do all of our extra sources that don't fall into those two categories. In terms of our Snowflake expenses, um, I think it's roughly 30 to 40% is for the ETL warehouse, but that includes like follow-on aggregations that we do on the data that's already there. Um, and then the rest is users and developers. I haven't actually looked at it broken down, but what we currently have is an extra small warehouse that runs 24-7, uh, so that's 24 credits a day. And then we have currently that block that does our transformation uh, tw every 24 hours, and that runs about three to four hours in a large warehouse. Uh, that's that old system where we've copied the data up and are, are doing a one big block uh, latency. The new system will be running every hour, and we've got it, or every half hour, running on an extra small. So we'll actually only be running that extra small. We've cut out that four hours, uh, which is pretty significant, and we'll also be reducing our storage costs. Of course, Snowflake went and dropped the price on storage, so that's, it makes my estimate look less good about saving it, but we are cutting a lot of the compute and getting it cleaner to users. So yeah, based on the credits, about 24 credits a day. Yeah, ours are in line with that as well. We actually have a bunch of warehouses that run 24-7 on extra small in order to provide uh, kind of different channels of uh, like pools of resources that can't compete with each other because we use some for like external facing platform, we use some for internal facing BI, some for 24-7 uh, ETL, some for nightly ETL. And so those are all kind of cordoned off, but for us it's about 20% ETL, 80% be like more analytics consumption. Yeah. Um, we do have like a runway and we did some forecasting based on what our current, what our um, database was on premises and then we looked at the, the uh, Compression rate in the cloud, I think we saw about, uh, ha we're about half of what we were on premises, which helped with costs. Um, and then we've also done a lot of testing. Uh, I know we, our JSON's pretty complex. I've talked to other places where the JSON is not as complex. And so we've seen uh, different storage models result in better storage options. Um, like in our case, breaking out the JSON uh, tends to actually be better storage than keeping it in and breaking out like some of these other companies have done where they do it more on a view or on demand. Uh, although we actually have a hybrid where in some cases we've got blob storage for JSON and, and hybrid. So we've been pretty careful in trying to, to keep our costs in line with our uh, 
with our forecast. But honestly, I think we are one of those companies that saw almost an 80% reduction in costs going to the cloud. So that might just be because uh, we're, we're very keen on optimizing as best we can. Almost the exact same story for us. I mean, we, um, in comparing it to other, other tools at the time when we were building out our analytics infrastructure, there was, wasn't really anything to compare it to um, that was in the, even in the same you know, order of magnitude. So um, we do our best to keep the, uh, the tables that do have that kind of log level view um, under control in terms of like retention duration. Um, but we, we really haven't gotten to the point where we're uncomfortable with um, even what the storage costs. Uh, storage for us is not, um, you know, most of our costs are still obviously on the compute side um, and we're, we're totally happy with the value that we're getting. So um, yeah, I would guess I would just echo what Erica said and um, just, yeah, that it's, uh, it's, it's so much better than some of the other tools that we looked at that it's not a high co concern for us. And I would add that because of the low costs and the fact that we've come in under a lot of our forecasting, it's opened up new opportunities with other teams where uh, teams that were like, oh, can we throw this data in? And we're like, yeah, sure, let's see what happens. Um, and they're like, well, how much does it cost? We're like, well, let's just see. Because they're worried about maybe like a million rows. And we're like, that's fine. Like, come to me when you start talking like hundreds of gigs and terabytes. Um, and if it's, you know, two terabytes for a day, that again, doesn't really affect things. So um, we're still in this new phase with say our data science teams who are working with large amounts of data to kind of figure out what makes sense from a costing perspective. And I will say uh, the way Snowflake breaks out their reporting on storage costs and compute costs, it can then be very easy to go back and say, okay, we're seeing you're using you know, this amount of money on blah, blah, blah. We can work out a deal or some kind of cost sharing or budget, you know, put it on the line item. So we're, we're still hammering out how this is gonna look going forward. But it's exciting to actually be able to have that conversation. Yeah, similar for us, we had, you know, we figured out that for us to be able to support an engineering tool that was going to need to run 24-7 on aggregated data, it's going to cost something like $9,000 a year. And they were like, oh, that's it? Like, cool, let's, let's just do that. Um, and then their heads kind of exploded when they realized that they were going up to the JSON and pulling this out, being able to aggregate it. Um, you know, granted, they needed me to write the jobs, but uh, you know, it was it was dirt cheap to them. Um, so once we were kind of able to kind of put it in those terms, uh, yeah, their heads basically exploded. <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't want to increase our costs versus where we were before. Um, we just wanted to get more value out of it, um, and so that's what we started with. Um, so we limited, you know, the size the size that we would devote to analysts and the size that we would devote to ETL and developers. Um, and then we kind of realized, you know, the, the value that we're getting out of this is so much more than just um, slightly better performance and maybe slightly lower um, compute costs. We're actually freeing ourselves up to, to do more as a company. We have a real data engineering team that can get things done instead of fighting fires. Um, so, being able to get things done means um, you can actually work with your data a lot more. So, it's it's now like like you said, like really a no brainer to say, why don't we just spin up a large warehouse and do this analysis? And so you end up, you know, spending more than you might have expected, but you're now deriving a bunch of value out of that um, when you make these ad hoc warehouses. So um, yeah, it's just like this model where you are free to decide how much you want to spend based on how valuable your analysis is going to be. We were already basically a two-person team, and uh, we really, really needed to not like have to spend time with that. So uh, our headcount is say the same. Uh, because we were already incredibly strapped for resources. All that stuff you was talking about with vacuuming and, and defrag and like distribution keys, it just sucked up all the time from our data engineer and kind of the same thing. Our data engineer wanted to do more interesting work. And when you're stuck all day figuring out what to vacuum and when to do it and you have to be up all night at all hours, it, it doesn't make sense. So it's, it stayed the same for us, but I would say we're, we're driving to a point where we can do more interesting work and also say develop our data engineer. He's starting to take on bigger data processes and be more of an architect. Uh, which is great because then it frees me up to go say talk to the data science team and figure out what they need. Whereas before, um, you know, the other thing to talk about is silos and we have all the silos of information. Uh, so by having that time, I can now go figure out what are the business problems that we haven't hit because we haven't had the time to even talk to them about it because we've been so bagged down, but just keeping our data warehouse 
alive and running. And then it turns out, oh, there's this other database over here that we should actually connect and drive better insights from, and now we can do it. Um, I have a similar answer. So we're all, we were also a two-person team. Um, I was looking at potentially losing my one data engineer because he was so <laughs> frustrated. Um, and I couldn't hire anyone because the work was so frustrating. So, um, so yeah, and so what happened to Headcount is we actually ended up hiring a third person, um, and I think a large part of our ability to recruit was that we were now excited about our data warehouse. Um, so it was great for, for recruiting, and we now have three people, um, and we're adding a fourth manager, and we're, we're like, developing an actual roadmap that's producing um, data science related products now. I'm happy to report that my team size doubled as a result. Uh, went from one to two. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, on top of that, we, we've found, because we've been able to open up these new data pipelines, we've found, I mean, in a handful of investigations, money enough to hire five or six new people, just you know, easy, low-hanging fruit. Um, I always make the case that I should get that headcount. It never quite works out that way, but it's been good. Um, so in our case, um, like I said, we're using Segment for our event stream. Um, it used to be called Segment.io, now that it's called Segment, so you go to segment.com. Um, it's basically Kafka, so you, you have to have a big pipe to send your events into. And then, um, you know, the great thing about Kafka is you don't have to you don't have to handle your events in real time. You can pull them out as you, you know, as you need them. Um, so, but what Segment's doing is dropping our events into S3 on an hourly basis. And Snowflake can just pull that in. Um, you just allocate whatever size warehouse you need to be able to pull in that number of events in that hour. And, um, and it just works. That's all I can just tell to, you. Just to agree, I think the main architectural difference is before, because we were sharing compute with our, uh, you know, with our users at the same time as we're trying to run ETL jobs, we were having to do large batch jobs off hours. Of course, there is no off hours if you have an international team, just somebody gets screwed. Um, but because you're able to separate compute, now we can actually handle uh, jobs more often, which then technically means you're, you're handling smaller amounts of data. So what we find is just uh, smaller chunks more often. Uh, it's kind of the same thing you see even just pushing data up to S3. Anytime you can parallelize, go for it. You know, break it up. I think I've gotten recommendations of about 100 megabyte files is really optimal for copying in to Snowflake. So any place where we do have a large uh, data file that we find is, is slowing down, we're going to run some kind of Python script to break it up into multiple files so we can stream it up. Uh, and any place where, say, we aren't limited by, you know, we have API jobs that we just pull daily, and so those are going to be as big as however they are. But the, where we are getting our largest fire hose of data from our web logging, we've just gone to that streaming method into S3. So again, smaller chunks of data, run it more often, so that way we're not dealing with, with large, large blocks. We got almost everything, at least all the JSON-based data coming directly from S3. We've broken everything up into 80 megabyte files that Snowflake can chew through relatively quickly. Um, granted, we were starting from scratch. Um, and the stuff, the pre-aggregated data that we moved into, like ELT'd or ETL'd into Snowflake was a lot easier to deal with. For Snowflake, it was, you know, chump change in terms of rows. Uh, but the, the bigger stuff that we, we ETL in directly from S3, um, we follow pretty much the same tactic. Um, sure. Um, so product managers, when they release a new feature at Hotel Tonight, are just super eager to know how it's performing. Um, so that's definitely been a big win is um, being able to analyze that data and join it with our business data, which is always the, the problem, has, had always been. They can see the events happening, but they didn't know how much value it was driving. Um, and then in terms of marketing spend, um, you know, you can, you can spend a million dollars in a day at doing advertising, but if you don't know how many bookings you're getting from that and, and what the ROI is, you can really waste a lot of money. So um, being able to have more real-time data means they can make those decisions faster and, and smarter. So Joseph, what does it mean to have um, more up-to-date data for analytics to share through? For us, it just moves us out of that, like what's the realm of what's urgent and more into the realm of what's important. Uh, we find ourselves 
being able to automate uh, a lot more of the kind of like first 90 minutes, like tactical 90 minutes of like a account manager's day um, by like kind of doing all of the heavy lifting that that requires um, in the data and writing all those rules. Um, and a lot of that is due to like our, our warehouse and BI systems uh, nimbleness. Um, so we can really kind of keep pace with that um, such that uh, everybody can kind of come in they they can move quickly through those urgent items and then move on to like more of the like quarter level initiatives um, and then for my team specifically it frees us up to take a look at net new analytics as opposed to like more of kind of like push analytics as opposed to pull analytics like hey I need this report or you know what happened last week to you know that this thing broke or whatever. And Erica, what does it mean for you and your teams? So it really depends on the team. I mean, we've got some analytics that you just have to wait for a day uh, because we're pulling from APIs and you just can't see uh, the fruition of, say, a marketing campaign in, in less than a day. It just doesn't make sense. Um, where it's really helpful would be anytime we do A-B testing, anybody likes to see it immediately, is it performing? Did it even actually go through correctly? Uh, I think troubleshooting uh, is a big part of it. Um, I know we've had developers that just wouldn't touch the data warehouse. Uh, we had data coming in before 30 minutes, but it was in that JSON form. We had a really ugly UDF that actually would break up the JSON, but it was really slow. It was very hard to get those kind of immediate analytics if you're trying to troubleshoot a problem and you need to know within the past half hour what happened. Uh, you just couldn't really do it easily. So now we're going to have better directional data uh, for those LDs, uh, where we call our, our A-B testing. And we're also going to have uh, easier for our developers to actually see, you know, did a change work? Um, so it's helping our staging and QA, uh, which will be great because then we should be able to catch stuff before it goes into production a lot easier. For us, we didn't, we weren't moving from Redshift to Snowflake, but we investigated Redshift um, and ultimately decided that um, it wasn't as much a like a platform cost consideration as it was a manpower cost consideration, um, and we just we didn't feel that we had the headcount to support um, Redshift, whereas uh, Snowflake was something that could we could support on our own without any additional headcount. Yeah. So the nice thing about Migrating from Redshift to Snowflake is that Redshift also ingests data directly from S3. That's the primary way of getting it into Redshift. So you don't have to really change your ETL process as much. Um, and you can also export all the data out of Redshift into S3 very easily and then suck it right into Snowflake. Um, and the syntax is, is really similar. So yeah, I would say that's a very... Um, easy migration and definitely worth doing because Redshift is one of these systems where um, the cluster is, is, there's only one cluster and all the queries run on it and anything that slows it down will slow down everyone and there's no way to get around that. So uh, I'm, I'm of two minds. I will say uh, our on-prem DB was uh, Paracel DB, which is the engine that Redshift runs on. So we kind of already knew what issues we'd be running into because we already worked with it. Um, I also, before I was head of VI, I did a lot of work at Ask.com and uh, I, dev, I had my own DevOps box with Redshift. So it's very easy to get up and running and great for testing stuff. And I loved it as a hybrid solution. But I also knew that when you started to do scale work on it, all the issues that Tevya ran into are exactly what we ran into um, on our on-premises DB. Uh, I would also say that what we found with um, be, be, by being able to split out storage and compute, uh, as I said, we've gotten very good at optimizing our costs. And uh, right now, Redshift just can't compete with that because of their fact that those elements are linked. And really, to get the best deal out of them, we found you had to sign a lot longer uh, contract. I think like three years was really where you started to get into something. And uh, we just weren't ready to make that kind of commitment, especially right now when you look at the marketplace. There's so many great things happening in databases. Um, you know, Azure Data Warehouse has Snowflake has come out. You know, who knows what the next big thing is? And uh, so that's why we ended up going. But I will say the other thing is because we have PADB, all our scripts will work on Redshift. So God forbid anything happen to Snowflake, we have like, I think we worked it out to we could be up and running from a disaster scenario in two weeks on Redshift. Because so, everything's already in S3. So there's a little backup there, which is nice. <laughs> So I think we had some questions over on this side of the room. Yeah. I'm um, fine. <laughs> oh, so I haven't had anyone yell at me yet, and they're pretty good at yelling at me. I got some yells when we were initially putting the data up into the cloud because I hadn't quite figured out all the, the ports and I was POCing it, and they were like, hey, so why are you running all this data up there and bringing it on our network? I was like, sorry. <laughs> but no, no one yelling at me lately. Yeah, I mean, our data started in the cloud, so we haven't... Um, 
and it started you know, in S3. So we, we haven't experienced additional um, uh, data transfer costs. And also when you're querying the data, you know, all the processing is happening on Snowflake servers. So you're only getting the aggregated results that a human would be interested in, um, unless you, know, you have a Python script on your laptop that you need to process a billion rows with. But um, there are solutions to, to running that code in AWS. So you could just export it to S3 and then run it on top of S3 from within AWS and not have to incur the network costs. For us, we've actually been able to eliminate, like streamline some of our like JSON parsing that was having to be done by third parties. And so we actually, we're shipping far less data around than we were before. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing is you get centralized data. So we have had very few instances where not only someone is pulling a large amount of data out, then they're also bringing it down. Usually if they're bringing it out in S3, they're then going to act on it in AWS. It's very rare that we see it actually coming down to the, to a local box. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Joseph? Uh, I guess for us, for the analytics team at ShareThrough, it's been more that we've been able to kind of push out into new domains. Uh, typically, when you think about an analytics organization within a larger organization, you think about a kind of like an internal solution, like data solutions team. Um, and we've been able to reach more into like engineering and diagnostics and even out into like our external facing product, building stuff for the engineering teams that saves them time and headache and kind of there's, there's like more cross-pollination between um, the engineering teams and, and my team now. Uh, and it's because, we're, because we're, we have more access to the same data, it's almost like it's, it's easier for us to speak the same language. Um, and then, then not only that, on the other end of the spectrum, having access, being able to basically essentially dump all of Salesforce into Snowflake um, and then uh, do all the wrangling kind of there where we're more comfortable, um, it also helps us uh, help our salespeople so much more um, because we can kind of do all those tricky things that aren't possible natively inside Salesforce. Um, I think I've kind of alluded to it. Like I said, we've been reaching out a lot more to our data science team. And so that's opening up a lot of options about how do we work together? What makes sense from a data product standpoint? Um, you know, our data science team has done a great job of working with uh, another element that maybe they're less technical, but they're more linguistic. And how do we get those linguistic people to be able to apply their knowledge without having to constantly go through a technical team, essentially remove that bottleneck? Uh, and is there a way that the platform then makes it easier to support that? So allowing them to get test data in, allowing them to not have to constantly go through our team to get data in. Anything we can do to alleviate those gaps and bottlenecks is kind of where I'm seeing the future right now of our company. So very nascent stage, uh, but really exciting, I think, because now we're getting into how people actually work with the data beyond just reading and dashboarding. Um, I'll just answer this question by saying that um, one of the things we've really improved is our development cycle. So before um, we would be developing on the data warehouse and, and basically make a change to the way we build the table or, or add some additional data to the table, and if it was incorrect, it would immediately go out to analysts and they would complain about it. Um, now with Snowflake, we can create a zero copy clone. I love the clone. Develop in the clone, test in the clone, point looker at the clone only for people who are QAing it, and then when we're fully satisfied with how that data looks, um, we can just run that same code on production. Um, the beauty of the clone is that you can get up-to-date data reflecting today's schema um, without having to create a backup and restore it into a new server. Um, so, and then you can drop your clone and recreate it every day if you want to. Um, so it's, it's a much better development cycle and it ends up making the whole system more reliable because our analysts are not finding our errors for us. We, we are able to find them in advance. Okay, yeah. Oh, and I guess just to add on to that, uh, kind of similar in changing our, de our development cycle, you know, it used to be we had to have a pretty clear data model to start. Now we're more willing to throw up data in and kind of see how users want to actually use the data, which helps us drive to a better data model because now we actually understand the analytics that they're working towards. Whereas before, you know, we have brand new data from a product, we don't really know the questions. We might have some basic questions what they ask, but then you end up with a data model that maybe it's hard to change, very static, wasn't easy to develop against because again, you're sharing resources. Now it's a lot easier to throw that data up, start to see where joins would naturally occur and then create a data model around that. Uh, and I think it's an interesting time because of the way these engines work 
you know, we've all been taught probably Kimball and Star Schema, but you start to see ways that the old rules either don't apply or can be changed slightly. Um, and you can get that way through testing because of the clones and things like that, which was a lot harder to do before. For us, the most expensive part is basically uh, graduating data into our, uh, our Spark ETL that basically is our um, like billable system of record. And that we have one team in our company that's dedicated to kind of maintaining that and all of the kind of things that are barnacled onto that, like financial reporting and um, auditing and things like that. Um, that's far and away the most expensive place for us to do any development, um, in part because they have to deal with some legacy technologies that are just so ingrained that they're tough to get rid of at this point. Um, but what Snowflake allows us to do kind of on the side is really work closely with the business teams to um, understand what data we're going to capture, and then once you've captured it, how it needs to be dealt with semantically, um, and then we go and do the thing and build it and test it and get it to the point where it's shippable in that kind of beta mode. And then we reassess whether or not it needs to be graduated into that Spark pipeline um, that's a little bit trickier for us to deal with and requires a lot more eyeballs. Um, if it's, if it's something that's not necessarily auditable or um, you know, needs to be audited, then we might just leave it in Snowflake. But if we do have to move it in that Spark pipeline, it is fully baked, the semantics are crystal clear, and so we can avoid iterations um, where it's more expensive. Um, so, I mean, we basically import everything into separate schemas that are not visible by um, anyone except the developers, and then we have certain jobs that aggregate that data into um, the publicly available uh, tables, which um, you know expose the fields the way the analysts are expecting them. Um, we also create a lot of views within Snowflake, um, but I don't think the the process is any different than you'd use with any other standard SQL data warehouse. It's, mm -hmm. it's I mean, it's it's kind of a drop-in replacement for. Um, all these principles that that are used normally. Um, so, but we have several layers of protection so that we can change schemas under the hood without affecting end users. Yeah, I'll, I mentioned it. So, um, zero copy clone. Basically, if you have used GitHub, um, you're familiar with the concept of a branch. So, say it again. Docker does the same thing. Okay. So, um, basically. There's a logical branching of the database. And so um, data that is written to the clone is written into that branch and not visible to production. And therefore, you can update, you can drop, you can add, and it's all being written into this branch of the database that, no, in our case, the development clone, no one else can see it except the developers. Um, and therefore, it's kind of a playground for you, um, and you can run the same code that you will eventually port over to production um, without having to like create separate schemas and ensure all the code is only writing to those schemas. Hmm? <laughs> it's amazing, because I think, I uh, imagine a lot of you have had staging environments, and it's always a pain to try and make sure your staging environment is synced up to your production environment, is synced up to your QA environment, and eventually things creep in, and then they're not the same, and it's just yeah. pain, whereas a clone is just a snapshot, and it's exactly what it was, and you can run it. And it also doesn't cost you anything in storage, because the only thing saved is the metadata, the, the changes, the inserts, and the updates. Yeah. So you're not like, you know, maybe a way you might set up a staging environment was to physically make a copy of the data, which would then cost you double in storage and takes time. The snapshot, yeah, but the snapshot is instant. So if you ever need a new snapshot, like I've definitely had instances where I take a snapshot, and I run my ETL and it doesn't work and I want to start with a clean thing rather than hoping to revert back. So I just take another snapshot and then I run the process until it works. Yeah. So right. the, I mean, the key reason this works is that every update, <laughs> every delete is, is a new file in S3, right? So it's never, uh, it's never actually updating a file. It's never actually removing a file. It's always adding new data to S3 and then moving a pointer over. Um, and that's why you can it's effectively branch the database or travel back in time and see where the data was at a certain point in time. Yes, which is why 
there's a feature called time travel. I was going to say, like, are we going in the time travel plug? <laughs> um, <laughs> where you can actually query the database as it was at, at a particular timestamp in the past. Um, so I, we do bulk queries from Snowflake into S3 um, and then read the data via S3. Um, and I think we also directly stream through the Python um, connector in some cases. Um, but the, the exports to S3 are super fast. Um, and then you can query directly off the S3 data for like a bulk analysis in R or whatever. And there is an R connector. I, our team is kind of split in our company. There's a culture war between the R people and the Python people. Uh, I'm more of a Python person, but I know that a large part of our marketing team works in R and they basically have connected directly to Snowflake and are running on very granular data. And I haven't heard any peeps out of them as far as concerns. I, I mean, we were doing pretty large queries. And when we did our testing between PADB and Snowflake, just Snowflake ate it all for dinner. And I mean, and then that's on like a medium warehouse. If we wanted to, we could bump up the warehouse. So I'm kind of waiting for people to start giving me some big queries that it can't handle. Um, we had people running some stuff on InfinityDB where the query just wouldn't come back. So I was like, oh, so we have to compare this, you know, how do we QA it if the data isn't even coming back compared to these queries? So, um, and the queries would come back in like 10 seconds with, with Snowflake. So it's just like, somebody give me a query that can't handle. Yeah, uh, for us, we know it's, it's not quite a fair comparison. What we were that type of work we were doing previously in Databricks. Um, and the comparison I always make, we had one query that I can point to that would always run. It took about a weekend. It cost us about 1200 bucks to run this query. And um, once we were able to just get the data from S3 directly, it was about four lines of SQL and took about 30 seconds on an extra small cluster. Um, so as, you know, as night and day as it gets, pretty much. Okay.